right now. How tall am I? So, before it shows up in the Q&A at the end, I'm going to answer your burning question right now. Six feet, five inches, and no, I don't play basketball. So, with that out of the way, today I want to share with you my four and a half year journey of going from a basement startup of 17 employees to a $1.2 billion valuation by demonstrating the business value of design. I'm at a company called Simple Nexus. Most of you likely haven't heard of us before, but we aim to streamline the home ownership journey. And by show of hands, how many of you have purchased a new home in the past five years? Okay, so quite a few hands. Now keep your hand raised if that experience was perfect, wonderful, stress-free. Okay, yeah, I, I don't think I see any hands, maybe one or two. The reality is buying a home is complicated. It is stressful. And so we try to streamline that. We try to make that wonderful. And we do this through a white-labeled mobile app and web platform that mortgage lenders can share with their home buyers and real estate agents. And when I started as the 17th employee at this small basement startup, our product was fairly simple. It was basically just a digital business card and a mortgage calculator. And that was it. That was the app. And that's what a loan officer shares with their home buyer. But like any fast-growing startup, we started to add a lot of features over time because home buyers need to scan their documents and they need to fill out a loan application and they need to sign documents. And we were trying to streamline the home ownership journey. We were trying to make it so a home buyer can do every task from their phone. There's one problem. In the beginning, UX did not have a strong presence at the company. And so the entire platform and app had been designed by developers. And don't get me wrong, I love developers. I actually started my career as a developer. But by the time our UX team had grown to four people, we had a major complexity problem. With no design system, our UI was all over the place the information architecture, the workflows, everything was just overwhelming and confusing. We had hundreds upon hundreds of feature flags and customizations, and no one really knew how they all worked. And there were several discrepancies between Android, iOS, and web that were completely unintentional. So as a design team, we decided that we need to convince the company to invest in a design system. We need to convince the rest of the company to invest in user research and user testing and make it part of our building process, not an afterthought if there's time. And so we thought, well, we have to speak the language of business stakeholders. We have to show the ROI of design. So we started finding these industry statistics, such as this one from Forbes. Every dollar invested in UX brings $100 in return. That's a massive ROI. And how about this one from McKinsey? That businesses that embrace design generate 32% more revenue and 56% more shareholder returns. And so we thought, well, here's the ROI of design. We just need to share these numbers with business leaders and others and certainly, they want that kind of return. They want that revenue. They want that ROI. And these have been proven by research. So we did brown bag lunches, and we tried convincing everyone of the business value of design. And guess what? Nothing changed. I have never seen that method work, by the way, in any company or instance. And why is that? We're speaking the language of business stakeholders, right? We're showing the ROI of design. So why is everyone not excited and bought in to build a design system and empower the design team to do what they should be doing? Well, we decided we needed to take a step back. 
And so I led the design team in doing a comprehensive audit of our platform. And we screenshotted every single screen in Android, iOS, and web. And we mapped out every single workflow. And we made this massive audit. And when you step back and look at it, it quickly becomes apparent how complicated and messy this product was becoming and how confusing the user experience was. And so we shared this audit with the rest of the company because we wanted them to see that. We wanted them to realize that this was no longer simple. But of course, anytime you share a link in Slack or email, it gets buried in people's inboxes. Nobody really sees it. So I took this a step further. We printed out this entire audit, and we put it up on the wall next to the kitchen break area where no one could miss it. And that got a lot of good conversations going. People would walk by and, whoa, what is that? And you know, our desks were right there, so they'd come over and like, what is this? And why is our product so complicated? And what is going on here? And so that got a lot of good conversations going. But we didn't stop there. I noticed how many unique button styles we had in our product. And so I took all of these button styles and put them together in a single slide. And we had this culture of company-wide show and tell events. And so I took my slide and I shared it with the company. And here's what it looked like. We had 54 fragmented button styles. And they looked horrible. <laughs> And there were audible gasps in the room. No one could believe that's what we were building and selling to our customers. So this led to a lot of great questions, such as, why do we keep building new buttons? Why don't we just build one button and reuse that everywhere? And it's like, great question. <laughs> it also led to questions such as, well, what is this like for our users? That has to be so disorientating, navigating an app that looks like that. And this was just the buttons. Like, I could have done this with any other component. And probably one of the most important questions, well, how does this impact business? I think we can all agree those buttons don't look great, but how does that translate into the bottom line? So we partnered with sales, we partnered with development and support to calculate that and calculate it down to the dollar. And I'm not going to share the exact dollar amounts. And these are statistics from several years ago. And fortunately, we've overcome a lot of them. But we had found that sales had lost multi-million revenue opportunities because the look and feel of our product was lacking compared to the competition. We also found out that support, well, 30 to 50% of their cases were stemming from usability issues. Users were, who were confused on how to use the product. And furthermore, we found out that our development team was wasting 20 to 30% of their effort on the front end, rebuilding components and building new buttons. And every time we needed a new screen or workflow, they were starting from scratch. And from that point on, everyone agreed, something needs to change. So from that point on, as a design team, we had greater buy-in to do something about this, greater buy-in to go solve this complexity problem. And what was different about these numbers is these weren't generic industry statistics. These were specific to our company, our industry, our product. And so as a design team, we knew we needed a design system. That was obvious. But what wasn't so obvious was, well, what are we designing that system for? What is the future direction of this product and the user experience? What is our product vision? And I believe any good product vision should be founded in research. So my team and I, over a period of time, we interviewed 117 home buyers really digging in, understanding their pain points, their experiences, their journey. And I even went as far as becoming a home buyer myself. And that's my wife right there by the real estate sign next to our home. And that experience really opened my eyes because 
I was listening to all these users share their pain, but then I walked a mile in their shoes and I went through it myself and that really compelled me of, wow, this is way more complicated than I thought and these pain points are so real. And so I started to take all those insights from the users and the research and started a journey map it all and put it all together. We mapped the emotions, the highs and the lows and the experience and the pain points. And then we asked ourselves, well, what would it look like if we took all of those low points and elevated them? What would that future experience look like if we streamlined the home ownership journey? And so we started to ideate, we started to sketch, we started to explore these possibilities of what could this future experience look like if we solved all of those pain points. And our design team was simultaneously working on a new design system. And so I take these sketches, these ideas and concepts, apply the new design system, and I was creating these sneak peeks, these previews of here's what the future experience could be like. And here's an example of one of those sneak peeks. So on the left side, you'll see a screenshot from our current product, our loan application for home buyers. And on the right side, you'll see a new experience of that specific workflow redesigned. And even without going into all the details of the research, our industry, or product, I think all of you can look at this and agree that experience on the right is probably better. Here's another example that I shared with the company. On the left and the right, you'll see scre screenshots from the existing flow. And these flows had been designed by developers, and they mapped one-to-one -one with our database models. But the new experience in the center, that mapped to our user's mental model. And it meant combining some of those workflows and merging them together and rethinking the interaction patterns and the UI and really just changing the thought process from database models to user mental models. And here's another sneak peek preview that I shared. In this particular experience, there was no before because we were exploring entire new opportunities that our product wasn't solving. And this particular mock-ups that you see here, this was exploring, well, what if our product didn't just help home buyers buy a home, but what if it helped them become a successful home owner? We found in our research that home buyers have a loan officer and a real estate agent. And those two are holding their hands during the journey. They're answering their questions. They're helping them to know what to do and when to do it and how to do it. But as soon as that home buyer becomes a home owner, well, the real estate agent and the loan officer, they get their commission and then they disappear. And now this new home owner is all alone and they have to figure out how to move into their home. They have to figure out how to set up utilities. They have to figure out how to make that first month's payment. They have to figure out how to winterize their sprinklers. And what do you do when your roof starts leaking? And it's incredibly stressful. Talk to home buyers who, in the chaos of moving in and all just the stress that comes with that, they forgot to put the utilities in their name. And so in the dead middle of winter, their electricity went out. And they had no idea what to do. And so we explored this whole opportunity. Well, what if this platform we created that helps us someone to buy a home, what if it continued? What if we helped them move into that home and we helped them set up their utilities and we helped them manage this large financial asset that they've taken on? And we sh I shared these sneak peeks and previews in a public company Slack channel where anyone could see them, anyone could comment, and it started building a lot of momentum, a lot of excitement and energy. And everyone saw these and were just amazed and surprised and excited. And why aren't we building that? Why aren't we doing that? Let's do it. And it started getting attention from business leaders. And they were getting excited. And it became this collaborative process where people could contribute their ideas. And we could collaborate and co-create together. And they also, different departments help set us up with customers and users we could test and validate these concepts with. And eventually, the conversation started to shift from, are we doing this, to how do we do this? 
And that's when you know you have a compelling vision. And it's a great question. Where do we start? As a small but fast-growing company, we didn't have the luxury to create a separate development team and have them build an entire new platform and mobile app from the ground up. We couldn't afford to create a separate team that spends one to two years doing this. We knew it had to be iterative. It had to be incremental. And it was going to take a while. This was an ambitious three to five year vision. And so we started coordinating with every department, getting their insights, getting their feedback, asking them, what do you think makes sense? What's the business rationale? What's the order we should tackle this vision in? And eventually, we landed on this nine-step plan or strategy with the nine key milestones or phases that we felt like made sense and the order we should tackle them in, the key different opportunity areas to go from where we were to where we wanted to be. We all recognized this was ambitious. This was probably going to take three to five years. But at this point, I was ecstatic because we had done the research. We had a design system. We had a product vision. We had a plan and a strategy. Everyone was bought in. Everyone agreed this should be the future direction of the company. So what could possibly go wrong? And there's one thing I've learned. It's that anything can go wrong. <laughs> the global pandemic was not part of that nine-step plan. <laughs> And it certainly complicated the home buying journey. If any of you have been following the housing industry the past several years, then you know what a chaotic roller coaster ride it has been. Interest rates plummeted to all time lows at the beginning of the pandemic, but then just as quickly shot to being really high. Home prices have been all over the place, making it extremely difficult for new home buyers. And especially during the era of social distancing, well, how do you tour homes in person? How do you sign those closing documents and get the keys while also maintaining six feet apart from everyone? And it wasn't just the global pandemic that complicated things, but just several other assumptions we had that were then validated. And the reality looked much more like this. It was much more messier. Makes me think of the previous presentation with that innovative fish and then the bear coming and... That was us, <laughs> but that's okay. I love this quote from Jeff Bezos when he said, be stubborn on the long-term vision, but flexible on the details. Our long-term vision hasn't changed. We are streamlining the home ownership journey, but the details, the strategy, the plans, yes, we've had to iterate, we've had to adapt, We've had to validate, and we've had to pivot, and we've had to learn as we go. But that's okay. I also love this quote from Norman Vincent Peale when he said, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. We were pursuing a very ambitious vision, especially as a small startup and a small company. But I do believe because we were shooting for such an ambitious vision that was compelling us forward, we did land among the stars. As an example, as of January of last year, a small basement startup of 17 employees had grown to 300. And our product was making an impact in the mortgage industry. We were touching one in seven loans in the United States, which was tremendous reach and impact. And our, des our design team grew tremendously. What started as one and a half designers was now 12 designers. And for the first time ever, we finally had a multi-platform design system on iOS, Android, and web in both Figma and code. And that was a huge monumental step from where we were from that button audit I shared earlier. And more importantly, we saw changes in user behavior. Home buying tasks that used to take days were now getting accomplished in a matter of hours, a 9.3 times speed multiplier. And it was exciting to see that home buyers loved this experience we were creating. We had a really high NPS score of 72. And to be honest, 
I'm actually not a big fan of NPS, but it mattered to the business stakeholders, it mattered to the executives, so we measured it, we reported on it. And what was more important to me were the qualitative comments and feedback we were getting from users, showing that we were truly streamlining this journey for them. And eventually, this streamlined journey caught the attention of the worldwide leader in cloud banking, a company called Encino. In January of last year, they acquired us. And there's a public definitive agreement statement. You can go out and read it. I'm not going to read the whole thing with you. But I do want to pull out some highlights from that statement. They said that Simple Nexus has streamlined the many stages of the homeownership process into a single seamless journey. Their innovative solution and deep subject matter expertise in consumer front-end technology will extend our capabilities. And they acquired us at a business value of $1.2 billion. And that right there, that's the business value of design. That is the business value of doing the research, of creating a design system, of creating an ambitious product vision, working with other departments to create a strategy and executing on that, bringing that user experience to life, and making, it, making it the best experience possible. So, takeaways. I wanna share with you my top five takeaways from this four and a half year journey. The first is, if you're wanting to demonstrate the business value of design at your company, or if you're wanting to 10x your company or your product, then you're going to have to do something specific and personal. It's not enough to point to generic industry statistics. It's also not enough to follow fill-in-the-blank templates. Your company, your users, your problems, the people at your company, are all unique and different than any other company. And yes, there's a lot of good guides out there. There's a lot of good advice. But you're going to have to do something specific and personal. In our case, that was calculating the business value design for us, what it meant for sales, for development, for support, for our company. It also meant doing that button audit, not just focusing on the logical and the finances, but creating an emotional impact, creating a compelling story and showing it to everyone to the point where they can't unsee it, where they feel compelled that, yes, there has to be a better way and we're going to make it happen. My second takeaway is you can't do this alone. You need to build relationships with other departments. You need to collaborate. You need allies. You need to support each other in each other's goals. And more importantly, you need a common goal. You need a goal that you are all working towards together. And hopefully, that can be a compelling vision. Far too often, I see vision statements or product vision statements, and they're just text on a slide or a sentence in a Google Doc or a spreadsheet, that's typically not very compelling. If you want to create a compelling vision, well, you can start with that statement, but you need to take it a step further. You need to visualize it. You need to show and not just tell. Show everyone what that future experience can be like. Tell the story. Get everyone excited and compel them to action. And when everyone's ready to take action, then help connect the dots with a strategy. Help everyone understand how you can get from where you are to where you want to be. And designers, it's essential that you are involved in that strategy because that product vision and strategy is going to impact the user experience far more than probably any other effort you do at your company. So it's important that you speak up that you be proactive. Don't wait to be invited, but just start contributing. Start showing everyone and working together with your product managers, with your developers, with the business leaders. 
You need to be an equal partner in crafting that strategy. My fifth and final takeaway is measure progress over time. Once again, I want to emphasize, this was a four and a half year journey for me, starting as the 17th employee and reaching that business valuation. And if I was measuring progress from week to week or month to month, I would have been incredibly disappointed because this was hard. This was difficult. There were weeks and months where it just felt like we weren't getting anywhere and nothing was changing. But when I step back and look at the progress from quarter to quarter or year to year, that's when I see the tremendous growth and the tremendous change, the night and day difference. And even today, we have our fair share of challenges. Everything's not perfect. We are still working towards this vision. We're still trying to streamline the homeownership journey. We still have challenges and obstacles, just like any company. But that's okay. Because when we measure progress over time, we're improving. We're moving the right direction. And that was my journey from a basement startup of 17 employees to a business valuation of $1.2 billion by demonstrating the business value of design. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Uh, a lot of excitement around your case study here. Uh, <laughs> it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, question from the audience. How did you calculate that inconsistent UI led to X million dollars lost? What were some... Uh, what were you asking, sales, marketing, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great question. So our sales team does what we call win-loss surveys. And so, you know, we're a B2B company. Everything I was demonstrating kind of focused on the B2B2C aspect. But at the end of the day, like, our revenue comes through B2B from mortgage lenders. And so our sales team does win-loss surveys. Every time we win a deal, we offer an incentive to fill out a survey to the decision makers of why they chose us. And every time we lose a deal, we do that same survey. You know, here's a gift card. Let us know why you didn't choose us. So we worked with sales to make sure that the options in there included the UI and the UX of our product. And once we added that option, well, then we could clearly see how many of our lost sales were caused from that. And it was very surprising and overwhelming that it was a major contributor. We had an assumption it was contributing to that. But from that point on, we had data. We had numbers. So I highly recommend partnering with your sales team. And you can calculate that down to the dollar. Awesome. Um, how did you measure that 20 to 30% waste for developer front-end work due to lack of design system? Curious how you were able to come up with that. Yeah, that's another great question. So once again, we partnered with developers. Developers, they're always measuring everything. They story point everything. And so we started looking at the JIRA tickets and the reports and how many of those were related to UI and front end work. And then part of this was a little qualitative. We asked developers and we surveyed them, well, what percentage of that effort was redundant, or what percentage of that effort was recreating components because we don't have a design system, but you're having to build it from scratch. And so it was a mixture of JIRA tickets and story points together with asking the developers. And that's why we have that kind of range of 20 to 30%. But we felt pretty confident with that percentage. Cool. Uh, how did you gather statistics across multiple departments? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is just, once again, building alliances and relationships with other departments. It's so crucial you have those relationships. And we have a lot of designers on our team. Um, one designer in particular that's here today, he's attending all of our customer success meetings and working closely with them, building that relationship with the customer success department. We have other designers building relationships with marketing and other designers building relationships with development. So you can distribute that work, distribute who's going to build relationships with who so that we have those alliances and we can work together to get those numbers, to get that data and support each other in our goals. 
Awesome. Do you have any advice on, I mean, there's a question around how did you get advocate, like advocate for audit investments from the leadership? Do you have any advice on how to, how to work with leadership to advocate for that? Uh, I will say if you want to do something like an audit of that size, don't ask for permission. Just go do it. <laughs> I kid you not, a lot of the things we did, we didn't wait to be asked to do it because no one was going to ask us to do it. And we didn't ask for permission to do it. We just simply went out and did it. And this meant really managing our time because you know, we had things we needed to do to support our existing work and teams. So we had to be very proactive with our time and our time management to make sure we were focusing on the long-term game, focusing on the long-term strategy. And at the end of the day, like, it's part of your job description to make the best product and user experience. So you don't need permission to go and do that. If this is what's going to get you to there, then just go do it. That would be my biggest recommendation. Ask for forgiveness. <laughs> if there's even a reason why you <laughs> yeah. have to ask for forgiveness for that. Uh, did you ever consider uh, having a usability session with stakeholders, meaning have them uh, use Simple Nexus to try and sign up for a home? We did consider that at one point. Um, we were actually, we were planning this whole thing where we could bring all the stakeholders and be like, you're the loan officer, you're the home buyer, and you're the real estate agent. And then we were going to challenge them to like, okay, use the platform, like make it happen. Um, we did consider that eventually that idea faded away, but I do think it's a great idea. The more you can expose the current experience to them, the greater it will open their eyes. I've heard stories of people who go and do usability testing sessions, and then they build an entire montage of asking users to do the most simple task and just completely failing, and then sharing that montage with the rest of the company. So whether it's an audit, whether it's having them use the product, or it's showing the users struggling to use the product, just do whatever you can to expose the current experience because one of the unfortunate things is as your company gets larger and business leaders have more and more responsibilities, they're starting to get further and further away from the reality, what it's actually like for users. And so in their mind, you know, the, the sales and marketing messages is, is we're the best. And so they start to believe that message of like, we're the best, there's no flaws. It's, you know, you're never going to tell a customer we're not the best. So sometimes you do need a reality check and you do need to expose, we can be the best and we're great in these areas, but we're still struggling in these others. And here's the plan of how we can fix that. Like an empathy program. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Make everyone buy a home. Go through the journey yourself. <laughs> All right. Last question. So my company is struggling to implement a design system across all dev teams in part because we struggle to translate user complaints to the lack of a design system. Any advice? Yeah. I will say building a design system is one of the hardest things I think that any design team will do at an early stage company or even a big company that just doesn't have one. And I, one thing that was helpful for us is just mapping those pain points of, you know, we found in three different parts of our product users are struggling to use the tables. And even though those tables were in three completely different solutions, they could all be solved by one solution. And we can knock out multiple birds with one stone. And so I think by mapping that out, um, you can start to kind of build that business case of, well, here's the value we can gain if we recreated this one component and made it better. It does take a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. Yeah, well, I mean, when you got 50 buttons, I mean, it, it's <laughs> kind of, there's a little bit of an easy uh, pitch there. Um, Definitely. I found that with design system, trying to find buy-in for it, you have to get a team specifically to focus on it. Yeah. And that's the best way to, to implement it. And like, to be honest, we still don't have a dedicated design system team. But we have enthusiasts on the engineers. We've built the relationships. We've made the allies. And we're making it work. We hope to get a design system team in the future. Sometimes you're going to have to be scrappy. You're going to have to be creative and focus on the long-term progress.
Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, let's give Mitch another round of applause. Thank you. Yeah.